Hey everyone, it's Michael Zapersky, and today I'm here with Oren Claff. Oren, welcome. Hey, I appreciate that. It was a short but warm welcome. Oh, we got more coming, don't you worry. So, um, <laughs> Oren, you're the, the author, author of Pitch Anything. Your new book is Flip the Script. Uh, let's put that up here so everyone can see. And uh, we're going to talk more about that. But you're known as like the, the go-to guy to get deals done. When someone needs $10 million, $25 million for their startup, their business, their idea, uh, they come to you and helping to kind of make sure that it's a successful outcome uh, for them and they have a successful deal. So let's kind of start off with how did you get into deal making? Yeah, well, I think you certainly when people need 10 million, 25 million, 50 million, but it's different for everybody. I think the differentiator is when the stakes are high and it really matters. And for some people, that's $5,000. Mm. For some people, it's 50. And for some people, it's 50 million. Right? But when the stakes are high and you have one bite at the apple, you're going to a go, no go meeting, right? It's not sales. You're not a paper salesman. You're not calling. You're not checking in. Uh, when, when they say, yeah, uh, we want to hear what you have to say. And then we'll take it to committee or I'll take it to my partner. And then we'll give you an answer on whether we'll go to the next step or it's not for us. When you go to Bank of America and you ask them for a construction loan of $5 million, they don't say, hey, that sounds great. You know, it's not perfect for us today. Why don't you make some of these adjustments and come back in a week or two and pitch us again? They go, no, that is not for us. Don't come back here. Thank you. Nice to meet you. When it really matters, that's when I step that's when in. when they bring you in. Help. When the stakes are high. Like I, All right. I, I, I might just put a perspective on stakes if I can. I know you want to drive your show. And I'll try and make it it's your show, not the Orrin Clapp show. But when I talk about stakes... I think about this. Uh, I was driving over the Coronado Bridge in San Diego. Mm -hmm. It's different from these other bridges, you know, in, in cities. It arcs over the bay. It goes over battleships. You're way up in the air. You are floating next to the gods. You look out the left window and Apollo is there waving, right? And, and, and so anyway, you're way up high in the, in, in the air and the battleships look tiny below you. And there's not these big guardrails. There's just sort of this retaining wall concrete retaining wall that it, it's formidable and looks serious but it doesn't look that big and people jump off this bridge all the time super sad but i'm sitting there driving my g-wagon with my family over the bridge staying in my lane going in traffic 65 miles an hour and i go i'm there's no chance i'm gonna hit that retaining wall and if i did it would for sure stop me right so it's kind of safe but if they took that away i would be in a bridge on a bridge in the sky 18 inches from death with my family, you know, driving a truck and I would slow down to three miles an hour. Yeah, so so, connect that to the, to the stakes of deals then. Yeah. So when you are uh, in a deal and the stakes are high for you, right? You feel like anything can happen. You could go off. You're scared. You're nervous internally, right? Mm -hmm. You do all kinds of things that don't assist you in closing the deal. You become needy. You say things you shouldn't say. You get off track. Uh, time, you lose, lose ability to keep track of time. And so as the stakes go up and the danger goes up for you, danger, stakes, same thing. You, you know, when this meeting can change your career, can change your life, can change the arc of your month, make, you, make your month go, give you exposure, give you the money you need, a sale you need to get to the next level, be something meaningful to show to man, whatever it is for you. When it becomes important, it triggers all kinds of behaviors you should not be doing. And yeah. that's why pitch anything and flip the script are so important because they give you the correct pathway through any deal and give you the ability to, even as the stakes go up, and it becomes super important to find a way through that doesn't ruin the deal. Okay. So now let, let's get into it because yeah. your new book, right? Flip the script. It's the subtitle is getting people to think your idea is their idea. And then you talk in, in your book about how people's brains are wired to resist other people's ideas. And so it's critical, right, to present your idea in a way that they think it, it is theirs. Uh, I think this is really important for, for consultants, that's, that's our audience, uh, really to understand this. But first, tell us more about why. Why is it so important to kind of plant the, the seed so that people see your idea as their idea? Yeah, in our business, and, and we're consultants, and with service providers, consultants, we sell things that are abstract in nature. And it's very difficult to communicate information about abstract services 
using language. Language wasn't designed to describe, uh, you know, financial services, financial planning. Um, you know, we do uh, M and A advisory, advisor services. You know, turning accounting into financial models and financial models into a pitch and mm -hmm. going to market and connecting the financial markets, all that stuff. Language was not designed to do that. Well, language designed to communicate information about danger. And so, oh, it, at the end of the day, buyers want to feel autonomy. And when we use language in a way that feels we're trying to drag them into convince them of something, we're selling something, when they can see the selling process happen and they feel like they're losing control, they resist, they dig in, they ask for a proposal. And they come up with objections, be, not necessarily because they want to resist, not because they want to give objections, not because they want a proposal. It's because they feel you're in control. And they internally, subconsciously, you know, whatever, I don't get into subconscious, preconscious, superconscious, uberconscious, but, but ultimately below the surface, they feel their autonomy slipping away and dig in their heels because they don't, they can't articulate it. They just know they're not in control, but they want to be. That's why it's important. And I think that goes to the saying, right, that, that no one likes to be sold to, but everybody likes to buy. And the moment that you feel that you're being sold to or, you know, that someone's trying to kind of work you through their path and, right, you're, you're losing, as you call it, that, that autonomy, then the natural um, kind of inclination uh, or reflex is to put our guard up, right, to, to try and protect ourselves. It's like the fight or flight. So let, let's get more into that because in, in your yeah. book, you talk about uh, the three W's right, that people can start to use to, to overcome uh, the, the guard that people put on. Maybe take us through, what, what are the three W's? Yeah, so, I mean, just, just step back before we get into the three amazing W's. Uh, ultimately, if, you know, and I want, I want to dig in on this point, if somebody can, this is why it's called flip the script. If they can see the sales mechanism happening, then they go, oh, I know what this is, and I know how to defeat it, I know how to deal with it. Right. And it's almost gamified. So and and this sort of sense of uh, get rapport with someone. Hey, good to meet you. Oh, you like football. I like football. You know, you like, uh, you know, hockey. Yeah. My little boy plays hockey. Yeah. We have vacation in Florida. So yeah, nice picture better. picture on your wall over there. And uh, that was that taken on that place. And oh, I think I've been there before. That kind of yeah. thing. Did you see Fletch? Oh, it's Tommy Lasorda. I hate Tommy <laughs> Lasorda. <laughs> so, um, yes. So that kind of thing. Right. To get a safe place to give a pitch. You know, and, and, and this is really the problem. And then. The, well, let's just dig into that for a moment because that's that's classic kind of sales training, right? It, you ha you have to build rapport, right. and I think it is important to to have a relationship with people, right? People like they they buy if they're not if they don't trust you, they're not going to buy from you. But I, what I've seen of all of your work, Warren, you know, you try and accelerate past that rapport phase to really just get into the the meat of it as quickly as possible. And is that because savvy buyers are just busy and they don't have time to to chit chat? Or what's your thinking about? why it's so important to go right into it kind of as, as quickly as possible. Yeah, today, the, you know, there's the saying, people buy from people they like. Uh, today, I think the this, this saying is they don't buy from people they dislike. They don't have time to like you, right? They want a value proposition. They want certainty that what you say is going to happen in the future really will happen. Mm -hmm. And that, that uh, you have skin in the game. You're not just going to get a commission, turn them over to someone else. And, and move out. So, so really, uh, you know, then we can move into, you know, some things you talk about, you know, the three W's or, or whatever. But when somebody can see rapport happening and then they can see you, hey, these are the features right. and then these are the benefits. They, they can see what's happening. Oh, these are the stretch benefits and then the trial close. So what do you think? Is this something you'd be interested in? Then the objections come out. Where is it? Oh, here it is. Objections. So, you know, like, the way to overcome objections, there's a million books on it. This is a good book. Like you yeah. read this book, there's, it's not I've offensive. Had Jeb, yeah, Jeb has been on the podcast. Um, and yeah, so he's a great guy, lots of good resources. So how to overcome objections has been done as well as it can be done. People say to me, hey, Oren, how do you overcome objections? And I go, um, I pick up Jeb's book and I turn to, you know, page, you know, you could, um, Oh, here, look at this. You cannot argue people into believing they are wrong. And so, I mean, sort of Jeb argues against his own book. I got to talk to him. <laughs> right? There you go. So, but, Oren, but, we can, you can bring the three W's and answer that question whenever you yeah. feel that the timing is right. But I think what you're bringing up is, is really important, right? So, it's 
not that people necessarily need to feel comfortable enough that they want to invite you to dinner, right? So it's not they need to like you because they're too busy with what you're saying. It's that they need to not dislike you. They need to, to feel confident that you can deliver and that you're credible and that, you know, really you're kind of, you're on their side. So how do people go about doing that? What, what have you found is the most effective way for people to achieve uh, that level of, of comfort, of trust, of, of likability? So, so it's where we started. You have to raise the stakes. You know, and that's you know, winter is coming. Winter is coming. People have to have a sense that there is an environmental change that they are not prepared for is catching them flat footed. And they need someone to, to, to uh, on the other side, they need to be aware that this is going to change the game and they need somebody who knows how the new game is played. Winter is coming. I think we talked, you know, we've talked before, but the perfect example of raising the stakes is making somebody in the, in the theater industry, maybe 15, 20 years ago, stadium seating came to the theater industry and it wiped out every other known form of theater entertainment, like complete nuclear meltdown. Why would you sit in a seat where you can't see over the guy in front of you when you can go to the theater across the road and have clear sight? How tall are you? You look like you're very handsome, but how tall are you? I can't see. I'm five nine. Five nine. Okay. Well, you're not. You're like me. You're not that tall. But anyway, in the old seats, yeah. it's my, everyone likes my down. hairstyle. That, that's why I stick around. It's my hair. Yeah, with the afro, still five <laughs> nine. Um, but but in the old seats, you sat in front of me, and you're five nine. I couldn't see over you, much less somebody who's six foot. The new seats. So that was. So you go. Hey, listen. Um, uh, if if you were a salesman in that industry, or you were an executive, or you were a consultant, for example. Uh, in either finance or real estate or whatever, you would go and say, listen, uh, these new stadium seats are wiping out everything else that stands in its way. You have six months before there are six planted within a mile of here. Mm. Okay. And then let me tell you how we got here, right? And you give somebody, you know, how stadium seats came about, the certainty that they are coming, right? And that, that's the number, unless somebody believes that there's an environmental change and it's going to affect them. It's very difficult to move on with any other parts of the pitch, presentation, details, anything else you have, value, ROI, um, uh, you know, certainly the prospects that you, the, the um, logos that you have, the, you know, you've worked with Microsoft and Oracle and, you know, all these credible accounts and what value, none of that really can happen without the context of this pre-wired idea. Mm -hmm. that some kind of winter environmental change is coming in. Every industry has it. Do you use that idea? And like, have you found that it's effective to, to use that, that winter is coming as you're calling it, right? It's, it's kind of like, it's the danger, it's the fear, it's, it's, it's the, the game changer. Do you, so, do you use that? Go ahead. Not fear, because it can be misconstrued as fear. Okay, cool. Because okay. that, that's part of what I, what I was hearing you right. say, right? It's this like, is the old system of selling. Yeah. So go, so go ahead then. So if it's not fear, cause I, I think when I listen to you talk about that, right, there, there could be some, I felt like, Oh, well, there's a bit of fear. If I'm going to, if I own a theater and I don't have that, you're coming in and you're telling me this is, this is going to wipe me out. Like that, I would have maybe some fear to that. So talk to me about how it's a little bit different from, from fear, just because I want people to be very clear on that. This is not selling based on fear. It's not fear mongering because you don't care, right? When you care, then it comes, when it comes with caring about what happens, then it comes as fear. You know, the Zig Ziglar, you know, light a fire so you can sell them at fire extinguishers, right? I, the difference is I'm not lighting the fire. Mm -hmm. So listen, uh, you know, you're in consulting and financial services. It's, there's a lot of podcasts out there. It's critical to have a podcast. Anyone without a podcast, is really doesn't, is not in the channel, in the marketing channels that are known to be effective and their cost to acquire a customer are super high. Mm -hmm. Okay, listen, we have a great podcast, right? My clients have a great podcast. You have no podcast. Mm -hmm. So we don't have this problem. You have this problem, right? Happy to help you set aside a little bit of time today, you know, time on each other's calendar. I know you're busy. We're super busy as well. Good to be here. Look, we have like 15, 20 minutes, right? And I want to see if I can help you uh, in what we know. Oh, please go away. What we know about 
the importance of omni-channel marketing to include the podcast, right? So so, Warren, what I'm hearing you say is that it's really about the positioning, the mindset that you have, right? You're not going in trying to necessarily persuade because you're not tied to, right. to the result. Yeah. Right. You're more really saying this is the situation and you're deliver like you're, you're a messenger. You're delivering uh, the message so that the prospect, the buyer at least is aware of what's really going on. And if that's something that they want to grab onto, then you further the conversation. And if they don't really care about it or you know, it's not something that resonates with them, then that's okay. You move on to the next person. Right. So both these books, especially flip the script is about caring about the customer, mm -hmm. wanting their account, trying to do the right thing for them and helping them. And at the same time, not caring and being willing to walk away right. and trying to find out which of those two answers is the right one for you and the client. Right. So right. caring, and not caring at the same time is right. challenging, right? So I want to ask you, yeah. you know, you talk about this, this message of, um, you know, the winter is coming, right? It's, it's essentially why they should care, what's going on in their industry, in their business, so that, you know, that, that you're getting their attention. Uh, you use that at the beginning of your conversation with the buyer. Have you found in your experience that's also the same messaging that is critical to use to actually get the meeting, to get the appointment? Because that's an area that a lot of consultants struggle with. It's how do I actually get more meetings, have more conversations with buyers? Are you leading with that same messaging, that whatever it is, the winter is coming, in your initial outreach to people to be able to set up those conversations? Or are you finding something else works best? No, something else works best. <laughs> okay. Uh, what is it? it it's, it's too overwhelming. In So outreach requests are like 35, 45 words, right? That is not enough space. Cause you know, if you get more than that, you're like, oh my God, this is a form letter. You know, it doesn't, right? Uh, so that's a different subject is outreach and pulling people into that conversation. In that conversation, say why I wanted to talk to you is this industry is changing completely. I noticed something, you know, so now we're in the pitch. I yeah. noticed something about you guys, right? That didn't seem in sync with where things were going, right? And I thought we'd have a conversation because from where I sit, and you wouldn't have visibility on it. We see the, this tariff, this tax, this um, uh, you know, marketing situation, this technology coming into the space. And you know, I, uh, I recognize you guys are sort of heading in the right, wrong direction. Maybe it's on purpose. Maybe you have a grandmaster plan. Maybe you're on the, but I thought I'd talk about what we see happening and the impact of it, right? And so, so that heads you into the pitch, but that's too much to do when you're doing a, you know, a call or an email. So call right. or email, mm -hmm. call or email. It's only job is to offer something that, that if you really even had it, they would want mm -hmm. and communicate. I am not a robot. That's the two jobs of outreach. That's how you get people to a call, right? The, the, the outreach when it's cold for a consultant or service provider, see the confusion is it's not about you the person sending it out it's right. about the person receiving it yeah. we maybe i'll just leave it at this because it's a whole conversation we send our outreach data to the philippines to be nurtured and com completed so i know what blogs the guy's been on if he's been on a tedx what he said on the tedx and what podcasts he's been on and which ones are interesting and what happened at minute three and then i can put that all in an email and say hey i noticed Da, 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 da. These are things about you. Super interesting. And the other thing that needs to go in there is randomness. Randomness has to be in cold or cool outreach because otherwise. What do you mean, what do you mean by randomness? Randomness is something that signals that I'm not going down a list right. or robo dialing. Right. Hey, I was talking to Michael. I was talking to John, Tim, Joe, Susan, Heather, Jeff, Joe, Whatever. and yeah. your yeah. name came up and they said, Hey, uh, I looked you up and I realized you do, you're doing X. We just did one of those. Uh, coincidence, maybe, maybe not. Thought I'd jam off an email. Right. Right? Yeah. There, there has to, I'm not a robot. It has, I know things about you. And there's a, the, some randomness created this. And, and this is when the stakes are high. Like it's hard to do, you know, 5,000 emails like this. But we do this at volume. You know, we could do 1,500 emails but each one feels to the person receiving it yeah. like, like someone 
has actually crafted this email and there's somebody at the other end of it. So that's, yeah. that's outreach. That, that's so important. And I know your book is not about outreach, but just to put it out there for everyone, like, I think that that's important because these days everyone's searching for like the automated solution and how can you do things at scale and at volume. Um, but when you're, especially in consulting, it's, it's not about volume, right? It's, it's about really making sure that you can differentiate yourself. And the way to do that is exactly what you just mentioned, Oren, right? Which is to make sure that you're, you're customizing, you're spending a little bit of time putting something unique in there that shows that you're not just putting them into a system and it's, you know, sending out the same thing to, to a thousand people. Um, that's ultimately what, what will get you a higher level response. So let's get back into your, into your book right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, should we talk about the, the three W's and, and what they are and kind of why they're so important? Well, you asked me questions about them rather than me lecturing on them. Well, I mean, I, yeah, I just, I wanted you to kind of take us through what the three W's are in terms of the, the, you know, in your book, you talk about that they're, they should be included in every presentation and in every conversation that you have with a buyer. Um, you know, that's, so I thought if you want to talk about that, the other thing I want to ask you about, which we can maybe move on to this if, if you'd like as well, is that you mentioned that it's important for, uh, for you to give the buyer permission to start asking you questions uh you know kind of start questioning you and and your deal and that stood out to me because i think a lot of people would would think why is that like why why do you want to give the buyer permission to start asking you questions or to question you and your deal and so maybe you could just talk about that as well yeah so i think one of the w's that's so important to me is why you right so if i ask anybody nine out of ten 19 out of 20 39 out of 40 people and say why you and they'll say credentials, experience, um, capability, maybe some will touch on integrity, um, you know, and, and mainly it will be about capability. Mm -hmm. Sure. But really the rest of the pitch answers that. Why, why you really is about do you have skin in the game? How do I know that after I give you the money, after I sign the contract and agree to give the money, after we're in business together, I'll really get the things you're saying, right? And the, the real answer to why you is because I have skin in the game. So how do you convey that? Well, it's easy for consultants, right? Because I just go, hey, type my name in the internet. I've been doing this for 20 years. Not a single complaint. As a matter of fact, the first 75 pages on the internet are about me saying great things, right? Half right. the internet. <laughs> and, and so I can't have, I have skin in the game I'm doing something personally with you. I cannot have you go, you know, um, um, buy orangclaffsucks.com, you know, and put up, or, or, or uh, I cannot have you, and, and also I need, you know, I do four of these a year. I dedicate my entire business to one at a time. This has to work out. You know, over at uh, XYZ Competitor, they have 50 people. They start 30 of these and they complete 10. Yeah. And that's their model. I start one and I complete one. Right. This. So whatever the the rationale is, you have to show people how you have skin in the game and the out. We're in, you know, everybody knows, you know, we're in the canoe together. Or we're in the boat together, whatever metaphor you want to use. When they when when they're when they need to know why you it's not about your capability. The rest of the you know other parts of the pitch are about that. That is um, why is there mutually assured destruction mm -hmm. if this doesn't work? And is that something that you are communicating to the buyer yourself? Like it's coming from you or are you just prepared with that so that when they start asking you about, Hey, how are you different from, you know, uh, big Jill's, you know, consultancy over there that, that you are prepared to, to respond to, or are you bringing that up even before they get to it? So, uh, I am trying to get it set aside as early as I can. Right. Which is it? And in our business, it's funny. I just talked to another company uh, that we're collaborative with. They're in the exact same business, and they go, "Yeah, you know, the clients pay me forty thousand dollars, and that's gone the day we get it." That's what I tell my clients, right? It, they give us forty thousand dollars, seventy-five thousand dollars. It doesn't matter. We spend it the day we get it because we have analysts and all kinds of smart people from Goldman Sachs. They don't believe us, right? Uh, but I have to communicate to them, "Hey, you're giving us forty thousand. At the same time, I write a check for forty thousand." Because the real cost of this is like $100,000. So we have mutually assured uh, 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 need for success. And not only that, we get paid many times on success, right? Mm -hmm. So I put in my own money. You got to put in a little money to have skin in the game. I have skin in the game. But we're both pulling for the same thing because when this succeeds, everybody gets paid. Right. And so that's how we answer it. Now, how are you better 
how are you different than Jack and Jill consulting? That's a tough one, right? And so uh, I'm trying to think what pages that falls in on Flip the Script, but this, it's great. And I, I got this a while ago and I thought to myself, I started feeling myself go down the road of how we're better, right? Mm -hmm. But the real, it, that is a rat hole, is it, that is a, a tar pit you will never pull yourself out of, is yeah. convincing someone that you're better than the other guys. Well, it's, and it's also like to, to your earlier point, it's better to try and deal with all those potential objections or things that come up, right, even before they appear. So you don't have to be, you know, on the defensive, right? If you come in with the offensive, then you're able just to take care of those things, the questions that the buyer likely has, but you've already, you know, taken care of them before they even start to bring it up. And so now you're in that place of, of power rather than having to try and defend yourself later on. Would you agree? Yes, I agree. You try and get those set aside, but they will ask the question because somebody will come in late. Some big wig will go, you know, uh, how are you different from McKinsey, right? Uh, hey, motherfucker, go write them a million dollar check if you have it. That's how we're different. But you don't have to say that. <laughs> um, the, the, there's two answers, right? One is we're not different. We're all the same. So commoditize in, instead of trying to get the relative value of them because no ma think about it no matter what you say after how are you better it is in your own self-interest to say it and is 100 percent discounted mm -hmm. so you can't answer the question it's a kobayashi maru right and 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 it, it's a game that's set up to not be able to be won so the answer is oh we're not any different all of us do the exact same thing, and then you do a flash roll, right? Which is, um, I think, chapter three. Uh, you know, so we take your financial model and uh, we correlate to the accounting, and we try and produce three years of historical financials and show that you have twenty percent year over year growth. We produce some board packets and uh, uh, get a board of advisors set up, and we produce a deck that tells your story, and we test the deck in a couple of trial meetings, and then we email ten or twenty uh, closely uh, held firms, and we put you in front of them with some training. Everybody does that. If you don't do that, you can't be in our industry. So we're all exactly the same. So if that's what you're looking for, mm -hmm. generic, 101, accounting, financial services, wealth management, there, I can send you to a bunch of firms that do that. Just say, hey, Oren, I'm looking for generic 101 every day, out of the box, Costco, XYZ consulting. And I will send you to one of my buddies that does that. It's cheap. It's decent and it will get you out of a pickle because that's not what we do. You know, on the other end, you have McKinsey. They do the exact same thing. You can repeat the flash roll again. So if you have a million bucks, because you walk in the door, McKinsey, they're like, hi, nice to meet you. You know, here's a cup of kombucha. By the way, do you have a million dollar check so I can let you in to speak to a partner? You know, that's how it works there. If, but in all seriousness, if your board of directors and your wife and your partner and your advisors, anybody want, you know, McKinsey or PwC or JP Morgan or whoever, they want a name stamped on it. I got a great guy who works at Goldman. I'll send you over there or, or McKinsey. But I can tell you this, for the fifty, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 you have, whatever, for the size of company, you, at McKinsey, you're going to get interns, like guys who started yesterday. Yeah. Okay. And that's not what we do, right? What we do is for a $20 million firm who actually needs this done at the highest level possible, He's done correctly with experience, having done this a thousand times with great certainty on the outcome, doing it um, with, with, uh, alongside you. We won't, you know, we're not going to work on your business harder than you, but we'll work as hard as you will. And, and the last 20 deals we've done have been exactly the same. Your size company, your problem. We solve this all. If that's what you want done at the highest level for somebody um, who knows how to do this, we can talk, you know, if our circles overlap and be willing to undertake your problem. We saw this all the time. We don't have this problem. You have it. So what I think is really powerful, what you just shared there, Oren, like everyone listening to this might go, well, that's not the language that I would use or I'd feel comfortable with. And, and that's all, all, all good. What I want everyone to notice is what you've just done, right? By, by having that conversation or essentially planting those seeds, the, the concerns that a buyer would have, because they're, they're thinking those things anyways, but you're just bringing them out into the open. And so now they feel that, you know, you're not attached to the decision. You'd love to have their business, but it's, it's not something that you're going to, um, 
you know, to bend over for it's, it's, you have a lot of other options that you, you know, or other people that you could serve as well. And so it's like, you're putting it out there and now they get to decide where they really want to play. Um, so I think that that's really, really powerful. You talk about it in your book, right? This idea of, of inception and yeah. that's like the core idea, right? Based on the, on the subtitle here, right? So kind of like getting people uh, to think your idea is, is their idea. And you, you give a formula actually a little bit later on in the book, which is like pessimism plus autonomy plus expertise equals inception. I don't think we have time necessarily to go into the whole formula here, but I'd love if you could just maybe talk a little bit more about what is the key. If you had to kind of boil it down, and I highly recommend that everyone does go and check out the book, but if you had to boil it down, how do people plant that seed? How do people get buyers to think that, that their idea, that the consultant's idea is actually the buyer's idea? How, what's what's the key to, to making that happen? Yeah, so so that's a great it's a great question. And just so we all are talking about the same thing, you know, just give you an example. Last weekend, uh, there was a, we had a buyer in town, big account. It's probably you know two hundred seventy five thousand dollars a year services consulting account. And the guy comes by, and we sit with him within an hour, and we talk about it, and we get up to leave. You know, the main role was to to look at the scope and the services and everything like that. And he leaves, and I say, Jonathan, um, you know, on the way out, hey, how do we get this agreement? Like that's the best close I have, right? I, I'm not a closer because we don't overcome objections. Hey, I go, hey, Jonathan, how do we get this agreement signed? He goes, oh, I signed it an hour ago. It's on the conference table. That's inception where the guy has signed the deal, hasn't price negotiated it at all, hasn't marked it up, and didn't even tell you that it's closed. Mm. The deal's already closed and you're, you're still working. So, so, so we, I, work, work us through that. How did you make that happen? At, may, if you want to use that as an example or another example, what happened there so that it was a successful deal for you? Yeah, yeah. So one of the things we already talked about is making him aware that his, the, the industry that he's in, which they, they market to hospitals, you cannot – market to hospitals. You can't call them. You can't reach them. They don't take your call. They don't open emails, right? There's a new omni-channel method for that, that is really requires data science. So today, the last two generations of marketing in the hospital systems uh, were, you know, one was manual and then one manual sales automation. And now it's data science. And if you don't know data science, you don't have the skills to do it today. Mm -hmm. So that was one. The other thing we had to get him on top of is that. Sorry, just to jump in. Was, was that an idea that he wasn't, he didn't necessarily know, or it was something that maybe he knew, but he didn't know how important it was? Like, what, what was so revolutionary yeah, or what was so powerful about, about that idea? Yeah. So, it, certainly in the buyer's mind, there's all these things data automation, data science, manual marketing. It's just under marketing. And what we did is we pulled back the curtain and we say, this is how it worked five years ago. Got it. Okay, check. Then this happened. Marketing automation came on and it worked, right? Uh, and so then we said, these, this is all the technology. This is how you do it. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. Then what happened is uh, the, you could um, get lots of data on an individual and follow them, right? And monitor what they were doing and feed them stuff slowly over time. And that, right? And that changed everything. So these new skills became relevant. So we organized his thinking on it. And then we go, what's different about the last two generations is these skills are not like a step up. It's not, right? So in the first generation, your neighbor's 13-year-old could set it up. Right? Hey, uh, you know, how do we set up salesforce.com? So, you know, anybody could do that. The next generation, marketing automation. Well, you know, you sort of had to be a 24, 25-year-old with some experience in web and it's complicated. Data science is no bullshit. 24-year-old dropped out of Santa Monica Community College is not fucking doing this, right? The skill level here, we have guys, you know, that we're recruiting from Goldman Sachs and we're paying them $220,000 and putting them here on the beach in California, right? And buying them a BMW to drive into because we need their debt. This is a level up. Mm -hmm. But if you, don't, if you don't get these skills, you can't compete. We gave them some examples. So that's, that's what we how we made that very real. The skills needed today are no joke, hard to get, right? And so that is really where the inception comes from is why is this hard? Because mm -hmm. if the buyer leaves thinking that what you do is easy, he will look somewhere else or do it yourself or try and get it for free from China. 
And so you, you haven't talked at all about at that's to that point about what you do, your process, your methodology. Correct. Is it more until the, the, the environment and the situation and the winter is coming as you called it? Not until he believes right. that in general, this change and doing what we do or other people do in this change is super hard and that we would have skin in the game in doing it that we wouldn't pitch uh, features and benefits and value proposition and ROI. People look at my pitch at that in a 20 minute pitch, I might not get into features and benefits or, you know, exactly what it is until out of a 20 minute pitch until minute 12. Mm -hmm. Most people start with that, mm -hmm. right? until they perceive that you have done, solved this kind of problem a thousand times before, a hundred times before, 50 times before for this kind of company. And it's almost boring. You know, as you and I have talked before, a boring push up to get this done. And they perceive you high status. They perceive what you do is hard. The skill sets are very high and things are changing. You cannot pitch what you do. And one one thing I've I've taken away from you know your books and the conversations that we've had, Orn, and, and, and your style um, when it comes to this is it's very important to to be specific. Like you can't go in telling the story at a high level and with generalities. In order to really make this stick and to make an yeah. impact, so that they do believe you, you have to come in very specific. Whether it's you know giving acronyms and percentages and dollar signs. The more specific you are, the more believable the message is. And so if you could just talk for, for a moment about that, you know, people, just so that people are clear, like you, to make this work, you can't come in and just give a high level, loose kind of, you know, story. It has to be very focused, very specific so that it's believable, correct? Yes. I have to believe that this is so easy for you. You can describe my problem, the likely solution or something you've done before while talking three times as fast as you normally do, mm -hmm. uh, as if you're just rolling off your top of your mind and you've forgotten it the minute you've gotten it out. Um, should we go through the car example? Is, is that a useful one? Sure, yeah, let's do it. Remind, time, remind do me, it. so remind me, um, wait, you don't have a car. If I, I don't have a car? You don't, wait, what's your car again? Remind me. No, we, I don't think we talk about a car example. So you, you oh, we didn't? No. Okay, great. What, 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 do you, what I, kind of car do you have? I actually walk to the office, so I don't. My wife drives a car; she drives an SUV. What, I'm not what a big car SUV? guy. So you're trying to do the generalities thing? No, uh, no, yeah. Um, she drives a, a Nissan SUV. A Nissan, okay, like a Nissan Murano. Yep. Nissan Murano, okay. When and what? It's like five years old. Uh, four. Four, okay, cool. So, check this out. Your Nissan Murano starts making a noise, right? And and. Not so bad, that's usually the belts, right? But there's like a little bit of crunching. You go, that's bad. Mm -hmm. So the dealer is a real pain. I'm not taking the dealer, hard to get to, can't spend all day there. So you take it down to your local mechanic and he comes out and he says, yeah, you know, I hear the belt squeaking. Tell you what, it's $350, we'll check it out. Uh, we'll tell you what our assessment is. If you decide to get it repaired here, um, then we'll credit the $350 to the repair ticket. Yeah. And you go, hmm, I don't know. Sounds good, I don't know if that solves my problem. I do know I got a bill for $350. Right. Mm -hmm. So you go, let me check one more place. You go there, the guy walks out, got a nice, you know, uniform on. His name is Eric. And uh, he takes a look at the Nissan Murano and he goes, Yeah, let me hear it. He puts it on squeaks, goes, crunch. He goes, Listen, here's what's going on. They built these in 2012, 2013. That's my, when the, uh, um, yeah. the disaster hit. Right. And then they, they moved these over to the Nagasaki factory. Right. And uh, a couple of parts they didn't replace. And one was a fan belt. See, this has a 27407C fan belt on it. Right. The correct one is a 24407.9. We have about 100 of them back. We see three of these a week. I've done 50 in the last two months and I do 100 a year. Look, Michael, uh, do me a favor. Uh, leave it here. It's $650. Come back in the morning. It'll be totally fixed. And this gear oil will stop leaking as well because the fan belt is making uh, the gears oscillate at the wrong speed. We'll fix that at the same time. Yeah. Not only are you going to sign up and pay for that, you'll, you'll pay more if you, you'll pay a premium because right. you're sold. Yeah. It, it, it's funny. We, we, my, my wife, uh, we have a, uh, we had a Range Rover, uh, an older model and she took it, <laughs> she took it to the garage and she comes back and she goes, Oh, they're going to fix the brakes. I go, great. How much is it? Right. And she goes, $400. I go, I, that doesn't sound right. Are you sure it wasn't 4,000? 
And she goes, I don't know. <laughs> so well, welcome to my life. But yeah, that's the point. Like those guys know what they're doing. They, she was completely, she's smart, right? They're, she's com- completely convinced that they're going to fix all four brakes and the raising and air pad system and everything like that. She's going to get it back and be safe to take the family in. And it's either 400 or $4,000. Who gives a fuck? Orrin pays for it. There you go. There you go. So the, the big message here, right, is, is specifics. Uh, when, you're, yes. when you're delivering that message, you have to be specific in order for it to be believable. One final question on this then. Yeah. This is all based on you going in and, you know, telling that story uh, based on what you believe their problem to be or, or what they, you know, the outcome that they're looking to have. Yeah. A lot of people don't necessarily know what is top of mind for the buyer because they've just set the appointment or the meeting for the Michael. first time. How yeah. can you go in yes. and make yes. that, you know, that confident case or tell that story confidently if you don't know exactly what they care most about or what is top of mind for them right now? Yeah. So I don't mean to be rude or crass. Sometimes a couple words pop out. Uh, and they had a little bit. You, you've been known to do that. It's okay. Bullshit. Okay. You, I, I can't think of an example where you don't basically know, like in our industry, companies come in and they could be in semiconductors. They can make brooms. They can, you know, produce liquid that goes in. It doesn't matter. They go, we, Hey, we have $25 million in revenue. We got $4 million in EBITDA. We're growing 25% year over year. Got it. Right. Well, you got like 25 people, um, maybe 8,000 square feet and some shitty office probably in Boise or Utah, but you live, you know, in La Jolla somewhere nice. Yeah. How did you know? Well, that's how it always is. Right. So it's not the case that you don't know anything. I just talked. So, so just to slow this down a little bit, I just talked to a pretty serious firm, um, you know, maybe $50 million a year and they get on the phone and this is where I was helping them. By the way, the, you know, for them, it was $35,000 for you. You, uh, you get it right here. <laughs> they go on the phone and they do this big, long interview process. Okay. To, to try and understand and find the buyer's pain. Cause that's what they call it. We got to ask all these questions, understand their situation to see what their pain is, which I think is what, you know, your buyers don't have 75, di- you know, your, your clients don't have 75 different kinds of problems that are never been invented before. Yeah, there's some nuances. And, and you know, in, in our world, they want to sell their company because they're breaking out, they're getting a divorce, that somebody passed away, they're sick, they're tired, who, who, who cares, right? The problem is they can't push a button and sell their company and get $20 million. They need someone like us to help them. Mm-hmm. That's their problem is they... Right? So you know what their problem is. Their taxes uh, are, are messed up. Their financials, they, they are, they're people, they have management problems. Right? So you can get a little bit of information and go, you know, I see this a lot of times. Let me take a stab at this. Right? And you use a crystal ball because you've seen this so many times. Is this about what's happening? Right? And even if you get it wrong, they will appreciate not having to sit through a 20 minute Q and A. When you are sitting there, let me just finish this thought. When you're sitting there asking them questions, one is they don't want what you have. They're not learning anything about your capability. You're framing yourself up as low status, right? You're boring them. They're in a meeting where they're not meeting anybody interesting, getting anything uh, of value, and they're giving you information which they know you're just gonna turn around and use to negotiate against them. So you got to cut this down to, listen, uh, tell me a little bit about what's going on. Oh, I get it. So, so the problem is about like this. Yeah, that's what, you know, that's what we're feeling. You know, later you can get the details, but nobody can sit through that 20 minute Q and a in today's world. They okay. expect you to know that stuff. What I'm hearing you say, or, if I kind of look, maybe reposition this a little bit is, and tell me if this is right or wrong. You you go in as the expert, right? With the focus of you're like you're focusing on the outcome of the most likely right. outcome that you're that the you know the person has, and the nuances, the things you might pick up in in the questioning, kind of you know around to try and understand the value and all that. They might have different issues going on. So in your case, like with an M and A, the outcome that they want to sell their company for the most money right. possible. The the very the nuances might be it's because of divorce, it's because this that and the other. 
your fo your presentation, your story, right, is not focused on all the nuances. Rather, you're focusing on on the outcome. But it, it's so powerful. You focus on making that story so powerful and so believable that they can grasp or they can kind of hook onto enough of the different things that you say that connect to some of their nuances, maybe not all of them, but it still has the end outcome in mind. And so if they are an ideal client, it will still resonate with them, even though it's not custom tailored to them at that stage, a hundred percent. Yes. And somebody starts to give me all those details voluntarily. I go, Hey, listen, I don't need to hear all your personal problems right now. Ha ha. You know, joke, but, but seriously, we can get all that later. I understand what's going on here, right? Done this a hundred times, right? You are all jammed up because the company is growing. You're seeing all these offers. You don't know what to do. You need somebody who can really help navigate it. Is that yeah. about right? Mm -hmm. Because what, what the fuck else are we talking about here? Mm -hmm. Right? If that's not your, that's what we do. We don't make websites. We don't deliver pizza. That's what we do. So if that's your problem, let's talk about how I might be willing to take my company, my people, my integrity, my ability, my background, my reputation, my financial models, my money, and help you out. But I'm looking at you, and you know, I, I, before you got here, I typed your name on the internet, and I, uh, you know, looked at a couple of things. I like you. You're a perfect account, right? You're straight in the. But there's some red flags. There's some questions I have to ask you, and some of them are tough questions, you know, because as you know, doing this together could be good for both of us. But if it doesn't work, it's a disaster. I've got my firm involved for something for six months that goes nowhere. I can't have that. So I got to ask you some tough questions. You got to ask me some tough questions. You're evaluating me and the same time I'm evaluating you. And if it looks like we can do three things, one, like each other. And by the way, I don't even know if we like each other right now. Let's get there. Okay. Do we like each other? Can we work well together? Yeah. We, you know, look, you're a good guy. I'm a good guy. We, we probably like each other. Can we work well together? We got to figure that out. Right. And number, can we build something that's good? Can we solve this problem? Can we do this financial model? Can we, can we train your people? Can we do this org chart? Can we do this management training, right? And not do we think it's good? Because of course, yeah, hey, Michael, hey, Warren, great job. Yeah, we killed it. Do other people think it's good? That's what we got to figure out. Do we like each other? Can we work together? Can we build something good? And do other people think that? So, so let's not try and take over the world in one moment here right? And take over all your financials and all your accounting and all your problems. Let's do something focused in which we go, Hey, that was great. So, there we so, go. so, so you say, Hey, Hey, you, got, you know, I heard you say before you might, you might not uh, talk in the same tone, but I'm so committed to this. I do talk in this tone to brand new clients and I go, Hey, sorry, I'm not yelling at you. I'm yelling for you. And they go, Oh yeah, yeah, no, we totally understand. We love it. You know, we love your passion. Right. But, but it's the certainty that you're conveying. And then the other thing is the powerful, right? Like it goes in and right away that that that's confidence, right? That confidence goes to them. And ultimately when someone is a buyer is deciding to buy from you or someone else, they want to feel confidence that they're choosing the right person. And if they're talking to a consultant that doesn't convey confidence, right? Then how confident can they be that that's going to be the right decision? So I can you know, very much see how the certainty that you bring to that in that conversation in your style uh, is, is very powerful in conveying that level of confidence. Yeah. And I think, you know, you convey a level of confidence and certainty in the way you talk and the way you present yourself. It's totally different. That's not me. Right. We're all, yeah, exactly. is, we all have our own styles. That, yeah. I mean, and, and this right. is why I think, you know, whatever chapter six, you know, uh, I think it was, um, uh, yeah. Uh, so, so chapter, chapter seven, how to be compelling. That is, you know, what, what people, a lot of people want to be like me. Right. No, you want to use the structures that yeah. I use and be like yourself. If you're mousy and you get scared, people want to fix that. Don't fix yourself. Okay. You, you're, I'm not good enough. You're not good enough. You're not good enough who you are. The, the structures will work. Don't change yourself. Use the structures. People hand me CEOs that are uh, straight off the boat from India right? Hard to understand. Call a spade a spade, right? Very technically capable. Have a great company. I got to train them to pitch. Hard to understand. Not plugged into our cultural resonance, right? Um, aren't backslapping frat boy, Silicon Valley, bad boys of raising money, right? And so I see they come to me when they're trying to, you know, they're watching Silicon Valley and turn. No, you go, and, and matter of fact, I had a guy here uh, who meets, a, meets his definition exactly. 
uh, and his first pitch was impossible, right? I worked with him for two days in the, in the conference. The last pitch he gave, people were crying. Not because the, you know, not because he finally gave a good pitch, but they saw the change in him mm. that he committed to who he was and did the structure correctly. What's the structure? Hey, so, you know, hey, slow down. You know, you're hard to understand. Hey, glad I could make the time to be here. I know you guys are busy. I'm busy too. We found some time on the calendar where we could all get here. Same call, same time. Let's make the best use of it. Does anybody need fluids in or out? Warren, ladies and gentlemen, Oren Claff, we're going to have to leave it there for today. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, again, everyone, flip the script, Oren's new book. Uh, we'll make sure that we have this linked up in the show notes. Uh, but Oren, just from your mouth, where's the best place for people to go to learn more about the book and everything else that you're working on right now? Yeah, buy the book on Amazon. It's $12 or $18 or whatever. That thing will make you a million dollars. If it doesn't, come back and complain to me and I'll take care of you <laughs> for certain. Second, go to orenclaff.com. Put your name in there. There's a contest uh, on the website right now. I'll fly you out to California. Uh, I'll put you up on the beach and I'll help you train up on this stuff where you feel comfortable giving it. So enter that contest and try and win that. Those are the two things you got to take care of. There we go.